so we saw Ankur just saying uh, fully high tech about the OTs and uh, systems. Mine is uh, more towards uh, brick and mortar and energy, so voltages, flows, all that stuff. So which is more related to again efficient operations. So what we will look at is the energy scenario in the hospitals, consumption, then what are uh, my experience of auditing these big hospitals, uh, more than 25 hospitals we have seen across country and outside India as well, and how they perform in terms of cost. And uh, then there is something on green building, some design process changes and what are sticks and carrot government is putting in. So all this stuff probably we'll just see. Uh, just an overview. Sorry. 50% of uh, energy consumption in Asia Pacific region in India primarily comes from coal. Then uh, if you look at again in India, it's same scenario about 55% is from coal again and we have little uh, like 2% of nuclear and renewable is uh, impressive at 11%. So that's a good sign. Then now if we look at sector wise energy consumption, then uh, the industrial energy consumption of course is 42% which is largest and then comes 25% which is even bigger than residential and other sectors which is in the commercial buildings. Now taking this 25% of energy consumption of commercial sector, further segmentation in hospitals is about 18% and closely uh, followed by the retail malls and hotels and other things are again at 21% uh, which is uh, next in uh, this thing. So if we look at this, there is a very interesting scenario. Uh, in terms of numbers of hospitals, there are about 69% which are government or uh, municipal hospitals and multi-speciality or private hospitals are about 31%. But then these 31% hospital consume about 64% of energy which is being spent in the country in the hospital sector. So we are looking at larger consumption of these hospitals. And then there are a lot of other reference uh, standards and guidelines which I will not detail out but they are available and people at the design stage uh, follow these. Now this is an interesting study done by USAID ECO3 when they prepared and launched ECBC way back in 2007 and where about 18 hospitals across country they had selected. So what they have done is they are looking at the climate which is uh, five climatic zones what we have, then number of hospitals that is size and the EPI energy performance index of a hospital that is in terms of KWH per meter square per annum or hospital specific KWH per bed per annum. And now if we look at our numbers they are varying if you see government or municipal hospital, they are in sing, uh, two digits and in the private hospitals of course they are three digits and we have one case which is in four digits as well. The global EPI is 145 kWh per meter square per annum and that too they are coming in from the cold countries, mainly developed countries. Switzerland is lowest at 61 kWh per meter square per annum in spite of being a uh, cold climate country and in Canada which is probably more extreme and uh, this thing and there is another reason the number of size of hospitals in Canada are smaller. So kind of infrastructure it goes in maintaining or keeping those hospitals warm per bed in terms of that they are little on higher side. So with this background if we see and if we need to be below 145 to beat uh, the global average even I am not talking about uh, reaching to best we need to do a lot of work here and that is what we will see. So in a hospital if we see 43% comes as a load from HVAC system, then the lighting is next in line and then UPS power, raw power and all these are the broad level uh, con consumption the patterns. So what are the findings from audit? All these buildings where uh, conditioned and healthy atmosphere they wanted for occupants and systems. They wanted uninterrupted and harmonic free energy supply or power supply. They wanted energy efficient and soothing lighting. Conducive atmosphere for patient comfort and uh, staff productivity. And most of these things had employed latest 
screw chillers uh, with efficient pumping system, modern lighting system, BMS, but always we could find more than 20% energy saving. So that's one key finding or experience I can share why 20% means maximum I would say uh, 38 to 40% are there are couple of cases as well. So why these hospitals in spite of having these good systems are running inefficiently is operation and maintenance which is in the long run uh, puts a burden on the hospital operation. Again, 80% issues were design related. When I say design, buildings were actually not functioning as design or intended. There were some retrofits happening. There were also systems which were upgraded but not fully customized or not fully utilized. Untrue estimates leading to wrong size of equipments many times. The loads were not there in uh, some hospitals on HVAC system which the systems were running always on the part load and many times poor efficiency of the system selected was also playing a role. Building loads are dynamic and utility designs were static. So there was nothing uh, which was actually working proportionate to the existing system. It's something they call as a square meal is a root cause of indigestion in medical terms. So this is something a dyna for a dynamic system, if you have a static system designed or installed, we will have these issues. And 20% issues were related to vintage of the systems installed. They were not upgraded. Older technologies were being used. The insulation levels were bad or there were no insulations. Windows and other stuff were not there. And negligence in maintenance also. Both in private as well as in municipal or government hospitals. These were the one of the key findings what we had. Now if we see there are a lot of complex uh, interrelations we will always have between equipment, schedule, building energy, data, certain assumptions or set points. All these will finally related to reported benefits what a system can give. So you will have chiller setting, chilled water, cooling tower setting, pump setting, all these stuff will finally result into some operating cost which in turn you will get as KWH per meter square per annum or KWH per bed per annum. What we look at is a billing analysis, end use efficiency analysis, then demand side or demand response studies. If the system capable to respond to some of the utilities. See a demand response is something which is uh, now or demand side management. Many utilities in Mumbai, private utilities like Tata Power, Reliance Energy, they have been asking, okay, in the peak load when they don't have sufficient in-house capability rather than tripping, can you have a system built in so that one of your critical load can be shut down at a given instant with maybe half an hour or one hour notice. So that means no standby chiller would operate, but can you have a thermal storage or can you have a some system which will still allow because and then they give incentive to you. There is a reduction in terms of power reduction usage, but also for every KWH otherwise saved, they pay you something like one rupee, one rupee 80 paisa per unit because it is far cheaper for them than to buy power from other grids and pay willing charges. So these kind of things are also coming and more and more our energy consumption are going up in commercial building. This is one of the reality. And in fact, uh, LEED uh, version 4, which is the latest uh, green building rating uh, they have launched, they are also asking for this demand side management and demand response as a possibility in the design. And uh, then water and energy conservation, most of the areas what we tackle have a payback of about two to three years. Of course, few major integration, uh, this thing. And one of the benefit for hospitals is most of these facilities are 24 by 7. So more the usage, more you save, faster is the payback. So typical airflow uh, setting, discharge temperature reset, these techniques which can save energy is something which is probably not been practiced many times and this is what we propose which gives straight away more than 10% saving without much of an investment. Now when we look at green buildings of course just to touch upon they are there now for almost 15 years in India and uh, they are being labeled as more efficient. They are aimed to reduce initial investment. Why I am saying 
reduced initial investment is yes if you plan it correctly probably we can do that so green building not necessarily will cost us more and then we'll have operating cost reduction of over 20 to 25 percent and optimize life cycle cost analysis and then also you can make it as a USP for your project. Lower operating cost in terms of water and energy and all these costs are going to go up, these benefits are more pronounced. Reduce absenteeism or better uh, health and productivity is uh, another uh, this thing. Socioeconomic benefits are reduced demand for municipal services, erosion and some water runoff, so less load on the municipal gutter or drainage systems then reduce automobile use and traffic congestion, et cetera. And then you have environmental benefits like reduce energy consumption and reduce air pollution. So how they have evolved world over, basically all green building system, there are probably more than, I think 80 green building rating systems are available worldwide. We only probably are conversant with a few but then all they touch upon site planning, water efficiency, energy efficiency, indoor air quality and material innovation, etc. And during these processes now in V3, V4, now you have a lead rating system available or IGBC rating system available for green hospitals where they talk about cadmium, mercury and other formaldehyde release, etc. These kind of pollutant control as one of the requirements. There is also one rating system which is called well building rating system where they are also talking about comfort, nourishment and mind. They are out of seven criteria, comfort, nourishment and mind are the three major criteria you have. And all they require is an online real time monitoring of this data and to be displayed prominently in your building. So if you really wish to reach to that level, this is something we are talking about what you can do and offer. So, See, many times as a green building consultant, I have been facing this, okay, okay, you tell me what all things to be done, what are to be brought, we will make it and building will happen green. No, that doesn't happen as green and that's the whole point of discussion. If you plan well, if you do well, building will actually perform better. And this is where my, this presentation I'm aiming at. Yes, you will have better technologies available, but what suits us? is what we need to look at. And when we have to look at these kind of standards, we will have an issue. Sticks and carrot, government is asking MOF clearances for many large projects. Energy construction building code were done in, uh, or they were released on a voluntary basis in way back 2007. And in fact, on Monday, 19 June 2017, this ECBC 2017 will be released, where they have actually recognized building as ECBC compliant, energy efficient building and super efficient building as a code itself. And if they make it mandatory, then we don't have a choice but to follow this. So today we are just talking about be, this being as one of the provisional activities and MOEF asks for most of these ECBC compliance, etc. or green building asks for, that's why these projects are happening. But tomorrow, if they make it mandatory, then we'll have a choice. So today when we say, okay, why I, I should be ECBC compliant, that is, oh, that is too hard. No, efficient buildings and super efficient buildings are already there and you have a norms for that, which are aimed at reducing your operating consumption and the first size of the system itself. So one of the common things in this entire process of all green building rating systems or anything is an integrated design approach where you have a team on board. In the morning and during panel discussion, we discuss about getting various people on board at what time. I'm talking about, yes, why don't you even appoint your contractor on day one? You do a QA check on their abilities, but put them on board on day one because he's the person who is going to raise objection Okay, yes, I probably won't have this time sufficient to work or I won't have this time, uh, this much space to run all my services through this. In hotels, there is a system of doing mock-ups. For hospitals, not too many mock-ups are done all over the country. So how do we ensure that all systems are going to fit into those areas is something this is there. Then apply, analyze, go back again, maybe. So this is an iterative process where entire team works together. 
optimizing components in isolation tend to pessimize the system. So if I just keep on working on very efficient air conditioning system, probably my envelope cost will go up through roof, literally. Or if I just say okay, I would want to save on lighting, 40%, 50% with LED or something, probably we'll have an adverse impact on, again, cost as well as so many systems running. Too much of control also is probably not required. So if we, these systems are not designed to work with each other, they will probably work against each other many a times. And that's why if we want to use only energy as a just one criteria, probably we will have an impact on something else as well. So typically design charrette process, this is some experience of uh, this thing. So if you have a standard con building construction, it will have a certain energy consumption. If we have a passive measures, which is at the design stage like orientation, window to wall ratio, glazing, shading, insulation, natural ventilation, daylighting combined, you will have certain reduction over the consumption. So you will minimize the heat gain and maximize daylight, typical architectural inputs. Then you have an active measure, something like uh, free cooling, energy recovery wheel, evaporative cooling, chiller selection, operation, etc., which is more of a efficient HVAC lighting systems and other stuff. And then you will also have an on-site renewable energy generation. So your this will be your net energy required for a building, which could be probably more than 25% reduced than the business as usual or a normal building, and this is possible. So if we have a design integrated charade where client, architect, MEP consultant, structure, and all the team members are there early in the project, we will have a better energy saving potential for the system. So as early as this we start, we will have a better team in place and better design. This is one of the most uh, pronounced benefit of improving your building envelope. If you have a cooling system, this is I'm just taking a case of one of the public buildings in Rajasthan where uh, this design charrette was done and the earlier load was estimated to about 225 TR, which got reduced by about 28% and 150, 160 TR was then the load, which actually, and when we have post in, uh, installation, post occupancy, we have monitored this building for one year in both summer and winter seasons for the performance and actual performance is little better than this. So, this 28% reduction, the 160 TR, that load never reached to 160 TR. They were just hovering around 135, 140 TR in reality. Maybe that could be a probably little uh, less severe summer of that year, but that means our estimates were not wrong. So whole 12-month analysis has proved this. So key learnings from this is reducing demand first through a passive measure, use efficient systems with controls, and then integrate renewable energy system to achieve your operating energy cost. And then you can have somewhere between, a bit as per the budget allows you, 20 to 40% reduction in the operating cost for sure. And then they estimate techno-economic analysis of energy efficiency and help you decision making prior to you have built your building. This is another aspect. You have probably don't have done your groundbreaking as well, but then still you know exactly how my building is going to perform and what is better option for my design. So for the same building, these are the results. So this was the per, a previous uh, case, what was business as usual. Then we had uh, uh, design uh, interventions in place, and this is the actual consumption, what we realize which is also including about 60,000 units of solar power generated through a rooftop uh, solar PV system. So this is actual major data. The last column, what you see, is an actual major data for that performance, and that is little better than the estimated one, is a proof of pudding. And then this was done with the, for 30 year crore project with 60 lakhs of increased cost. So, I have probably some 
about six, seven cases like this, and wherever either you have same cost or little overrun, but then you have a substantial saving in the operating cost is the outcome of such kind of studies. So if we invest wisely before we start design or at the design stage, then probably projects also get completed. So again, uh, what was discussion during the panel discussion, when to do it is probably do it, spend probably more time at the drawing board stage or the probably design stage and then work backwards. That helps in speedy and better uh, this thing. Passive strategies, of course, I won't go in detail of these, but something like this, I would like to probably address and ask you a question. See, for us, we know 36 plus minus 0.5 is our uh, body temperature, and probably third and fourth standard science, we learned that heat flows from a hotter body to a cooler body. So if our ambient is probably cooler than 36 degree, then heat will not come or radiate on us from the walls or roof, but probably we would lose something to this. So if we can maintain our surrounding temperature to as low as 32 degrees or 34 degrees, we still have a better envelope in terms which will reduce our cooling load itself. So in absolute numbers, the absolute humidity in the air, 11.5 grams of vapor per kg of dry air for a technical uh, term, which translate to something around less than 70% relative humidity is good enough. So people won't shiver, people won't feel uncomfortable, there won't be any sweat. Of course, for OTs and other areas I'm not discussing, but this is for all other common areas, which is probably around 50% of the hospital area or little more, we can have this. So in the psychrometric chart, probably you will see uh, areas which is, this is like warm and humid climate would be there, this will be a hot and humid, then this could be a cool climate, probably something like Kanakpur would look more into these regions, then uh, in terms of humidity will be less. And then you have moderate climate, either just beginning of winter and end of winter kind of thing, and then you will have warm and dry and hot and dry, which is more of a summer month. So out of all these months, probably, more than 50% time your wet work temperature, that is a water temperature in Nagpur would be around 20 degrees. So can we make a use? And this is not just Nagpur I'm saying, this is probably we are talking about all hot and dry and composite climate within the country which covers geographically probably more than 70% area and probably population wise this could be almost 40% area in the country. So if we can have these kind of differentiation cooling, so thermal mass, it was a probably privilege to our uh, previous generations. Uh, they could build smaller buildings with very high walls or thicknesses, not uh, this thing. So we have a case here, this is a simulated case where we have analyzed building performance. This is without insulation. So during these months, like mid of March till somewhere around mid of October, the peak cooling requirement or the heat gain in terms of cooling demand, KWH per month, it goes up. And in winter months, it is almost zero. When you have an insulated building, you are probably not reaching zero. There would be some consumption, but your overall peak cooling capacity goes down. And so if you take an average of this plus this, this would probably be a much better building to live in and work with. So if we can have a strategy designed for this. See, this is something simple, light shelf. We talk about efficient lighting or something, but yes, many a times ceilings are dull. They are not washed, so even building looks dull or the work area looks dull. So lighting shelf is a very simple way to do it, to penetrate light. External movable shading is something which is probably is not very common in our country or probably hardly used, where, see, I'll show you an example. This is a typical wall, uh, external uh, wall and window section where you will have an internal blind. So when the sun rays come during daytime, it will hit the glass. Part of it because of the glass property would be reflected back. And this my interior blind will have, there will be a hot pocket between my glass as well as the blind. 
which will stay there and probably radiate that heat back. And part of that also will be stuck within the building, not outside. So my effective SHGC, solar heat gain coefficient for this assembly becomes more than 40%. ECBC we talk about, about less than 25%. Here if we, for the same example, if I put an external blind, which is outside my gla glazing, with an appropriate this thing, I am obstructing this heat, not, not allowing it to come inside. And very little heat will be actually passed inside. So my effective EC, uh, solar heat gain coefficient through the glass is less than 10%. So I can use an ordinary glass, not necessarily DGU. Of course, DGU will help us to reduce sound and noise, uh, uh, this thing, destructions for the busy areas or squares. But otherwise, it can still help us to be a better performing building. Again, if we look at, these are again a simulation re, uh, results. So all your west orientation with an overhang as well as with the normal overhang and with the external, uh, uh, this thing, uh, I would say blind or curtain, one third is the consumption which is proposed. So two third you save on the energy consumption through that facade for the building. Double screen facades using some materials which could be, this is what, this is a, a cement gypsum board or a shera board what you uh, call, they are used in a fashion for the lab areas in uh, one of the projects. Then open grid pavers, creating this microclimate in, for the building, where building could be uh, modern looking or have glass facades, everything, but a surrounding atmosphere which will not again heat up and radiate that heat is there. So what is there in the, HVAC system. We want to remove sensible heat, we want to remove vapor or latent heat, we want to remove dust generated and contaminants from the space, we want to prevent atmospheric dust and contaminants from entering our building and prevent microbial growth. So all this is possible. So what we will do is temperature, humidity, pressure, particulate matter and volatile organic matter and CO2 content would be monitored or measured in a typical system. But what AHU does, it just controls temperature, temperature, and temperature. It will only give an additional humidity control when you are managing sensibility separately. So a function when I say, okay, yes, can we manage our sensible load, that is just a heat load differently, and a water removal load, humidity load differently, probably we can save a lot of energy. This is like a typical room circuit where I get my outside air at 35 degree, maybe the, I have not shown energy recovery wheel. Through an AHU it will be, I will have a water at 7, 12 degree running and my conditioned space would be maintained 24 at 50% RH give and take. So if I dealing this dehumidification by latent load management either by using a refrigerant based system or a desiccant based system, I can have air dew point entering, that is a very dry air. In terms of dew point is I am providing a dry and cool air which is ready to pick up moisture from the place, space and then again it is either rejected back or goes back to AHU and from there it is purged. So that means my humidity load is taken care by my cooler system. So if I can for a smaller system there could be a, a DX based system or a, a, a this thing or I can have a centralized system as well. And here my fresh air system will pass it on air at itself at 12 degree centigrade, which will, so my work on AHU will be only to cool this air from 24 degree to 12 degree. All sensible load by latent load is almost managed by this, when it is mixed at the AHU itself. Another way of doing it is the structural cooling laying of these kind of pipes on the slab, above the slab. Still we are not very confident of laying these pipes in the slab. Out elsewhere in the world people are doing that as well as a common practice. And if we can have a small 60, 600 watt solar DC powered fan, this is what uh, uh, can give us. So this is a scenario. So we had put data loggers, so normal scenario of about slab top and bottom temperatures were measured. So if you see my slab top temperature dipped in the night hours, it got cooled by radiant, uh, this thing, 
cooling sky radiation, but my slab bottom temperature never went up. But if I am doing slab cooling, my slab temperature throughout the day never went above 30 degree. So that means it is lower than my skin temperature 36 degree. So my cooling load itself comes down and then eventually in the night both this slab becomes like my heat sinks which is already cool so it takes more time to heat up on the next day. Radiant cooling, this is again use a ceiling suspended radiant panels or capillary system in the slab cooling. This is Infosys Hyderabad, a proven case study where they monitor energy consumption per employee per month. From the standard design 53 units per employee per month with radiant cooling they have gone to 18, one third. These are again proven monitored data for more than a year. So chilled beams, so you have chilled beams or uh, this thing where you will meet your sensible cooling by this. And then, and if you have noticed, here you can see probably ceiling fan in the Infosys office as well, along with uh, the air conditioning system, and is providing good comfort. They have learned, they have probably, I have seen their buildings in Pune and elsewhere where they had gone for very jazzy shape kind of a buildings in glass, which were leaking, which were not comfortable for people to work with. There were a lot of complaints and then they set up a whole team within Infosys. Yes, because they are probably dealing with few lakh employees all over the country and outside. So they started working and they have a separate division of internal division of sustainability. In fact, some of the corporate hospitals also do have these kind of system, but not as elaborate as what Infosys and TCS probably are doing. So here I can increase my temperature not to 7, 12 degree circuit, but I can run them in 13, 17 degree. So my supply chilled water temperature itself will be 13 degree centigrade and in return it would come at 17. So there won't be any condensation on wall or roof as well as my chiller performance would be far better. This is something I can get a free cooling during winter months where my cooling tower will just circulate this available water and this can be very well possibly done in Nagpur if designed at the stage. And then here through this uh, radiant panels, people can get comfort. So my ambient temperature when it is below 16 on 17 degree, my chiller set point can be increased. So I have just my pumping energy required to take care of circulation. My chiller will be shut probably for most of the time. And a dedicated fresh air system will be required, which will take care of a dehumidified fresh air going inside the office. Probably in Nagpur, you also won't need that because your ambient temperature as well as relative humidity both would be much lesser. Then night purging. The building interior structural surface like wall, roof and flooring, they are mainly of concrete, which has a property of heating up faster and releasing that heat or cool slowly. So if in the night temperatures when they drop below 12 degree, if you allow filtered air to come get inside the building and cool these surfaces. So next day during daytime, probably your cooling load won't shoot up at 10 o'clock, but maybe at around 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock something. Just peak time you will need a cooling, but otherwise your building would remain much better in terms of thermal performance. So all your structure, you will use it as a heat sink not just as a structure as structure, but you will use it as a part of your design to make it. So my peak loads are reduced and my indoor temperatures are good. See, typically more than 4,000 4, years in an hour, my chilled water temperature in Nagpur or most of the central India would be less than 20 degree. I can use this for two stages, direct, indirect, evaporative cooling. See, here we are not touching the critical areas. We are just talking about 50% of balance of the system load, which can have this thing. And then we can have UV lamps, we can have uh, MERV filtration as well from this. Pre-cooling, where if I can place my AHUs on the peripheral area, probably it will allow me to take that from 
this thing. But if my AHU is in the central core, probably it will not have an access to take adequate amount of pressure from the ambient. So placing AHUs on the peripheral area will also help me to save. Many times people ask VRV is better or chiller is better. So just I'm showing this is actual performance measurement of a system. So my specific energy consumption ACC, that is the magenta line, actually as for a screw chiller, this performance improves specific energy consumption in terms of kilowatt per TR when I have a load which is around 70% or 80%. And for the lesser loads of 40 to uh, 50 percent, my specific energy consumption of the same system goes up to probably more than one kilowatt per TR. Now, if I am talking about a VRF system, here you will see the best performance you will get at 50 or 40 percent loading, and at full load, that performance is again as bad. So, if you want to run your VRV at 80 percent loading, it is inefficient. So, run a system which is 50 percent more in size. So, instead of 100 TR by 150 TR system and run it at part load is how we, we are we can be working efficiently, but then you pay for that 50 percent extra initial investment in VRV. VRV is good when you have variable loads. See, in hospitals, you have uh, your OPDs or you have some uh, doctors visiting hours for a particular time and otherwise those rooms are not used put them on VRV. They will work only for two hours, four hours in a day for that and then balance of the system can work. Otherwise, all rest 18, 20 hours they could be shut. Yeah. So, this is something we are uh, talking about. Part load performance of the system is also uh, uh, this thing. So, if we have a variable turbo, turbo core chillers with magnetic bearings or something, the part load performance would be much better in terms of COP and if we couple that with higher chilled water temperatures or free cooling. And this is how my constant speed screw chiller would perform, which is a 6 COP is a very good chiller, but it does not have a variability component with variable drive or turbo core chiller. So, if I have an impact of changing my set points of evaporating and condensing temperature as per the season, from a same chiller I can extract probably more COP or better system performance by letting my changing my evaporating and condensing temperatures. So, rather than 712 circuit if I can generate or put it in 1317 or 1217 circuit my energy consumption would drastically come down. Now, in the coastal areas like Mumbai or other parts of the country, we have a desiccant based humidification. So, we are either using refrigerant or a desiccant, a chemical which will absorb moisture and probably you will need a heat or a, uh, other area to release that would be uh, there. Another such application is a heat pump, where you get a heating and cooling both through the same system. So, for a hospital, you can have these kind of heat pumps as a part of your design, where Chilled water generated would be an auxiliary system for your system and uh, it will take care of your hot water generation for the hospital. This we have installed in uh, Fortis uh, Mumbai facility as a retrofit to the existing uh, instant geysers and the system has already paid back in less than two years. Now, chilled water generated can also be coupled to give you a low humidity fresh air for your ICUs or OT areas, continuous operation if they can be matched, you will get low temperature air and you can generate a 712 uh, chilled water from the heat pump and there will be an additional fan power and pressure drop which we need to take care in the design. So, integrating heat pump with my chilled water system will also give me a dehumidified air which could be required for my OTs and uh, ICUs. For areas like, uh, I will not say Nagpur in the city, but uh, little outskirts or other this thing, uh, many hospitals can have their own power plants, which could be run on biomass or any fuel for that matter. Have a back pressure turbine, you have power, you have your vapor absorption machine, which can give you a cooling and then steam will be generated there for hot water generation. And then whatever raw material, this thing, byproduct, fly ash, you will get that can go as a brick manufacturing. So, this is a real sustainable model 
See, many of the hotels are doing this now in Mumbai for gas, using natural gas. So they don't get fly ash as a byproduct, but they put a gas engine and generate power, generate hot water. On that hot water, they run vapor absorption machine. So their entire cooling load as well as heating load is taken care by this system. Of course, all these hotels, exotic hotels, what we see in Mauritius and Maldives, they only run on this kind of a tri-generation system. This is a solar air conditioning system at the municipal hospital of Kalwa, 160 TR. Material. Then this is the, uh, I'm in the first, last five slides. So there is a BMS in most of the hospitals and it overflows the data, but it is like a uh, showcase. You can't touch it, you can't modify it. So it has not been probably customized. So like everything, we have Murphy's law. So you don't get data. So missing data is always vital. Sensors would fail, data capturing, nothing uh, would work for you for monitoring the performance. And there is absolutely no saving number or something which you can get from these monitoring. So there could be just some numbers which are better estimate than the other. So when we do a long-term monitoring, this we need to remember and understand why we are doing this. So data analytics is uh, again a high-tech thing technology because we have a lot of metering which are now communicating. So this data can be segmented, classified at the back of office and done. So you can have your operations monitored by somebody else, by a software, and somebody probably looking over that data or the software analyze data and giving you an instruction. We will see most of the uh, funny part about energy, is it doesn't probably just shut down or any system. There would be an indication that, OK, it needs to be clean, uh, refurbished or something. And all these something signals or symptoms need to be seen by operating team. Unfortunately, in most of the hospitals, the amount of technical team is not beyond four or five people who really understand that data. So if we really go high tech with the data, probably operating teams are also not there. So if you can generate this kind of an equation for the system, it works. So you can have a energy MIS, predictive maintenance, operation and monitoring through the system. Thank you. Sorry, I ran a little late. Thank you, Mr. Deshpande.